Hello out there and welcome to Day 4 Devotion. This is our weekly podcast that we have where we take some time to read a few scriptures pertaining to uh, the previous Sunday's message and we kind of unpack them and meditate on them. And today we are, as we go through Core 52, we are in Core 30 and that is leadership. And Dan, I know that leadership is something that's important to you and that you have often looked to me for leadership as I have kind of presided over you and mentored you, even as the younger brother. Right. Yes. Yeah. Very much a Jacob and Esau situation here with the, uh, the younger. I actually remember a story of you uh, telling somebody one time that we were born, that you were holding onto my heel. And somebody was like, really? And you're like, no, that would never happen again. No, that was that was oh, that was uh, a lie. Like Jacob was kind of known for, right? The he was the fever, right? Yeah, the younger, the, the younger twin is the savvy twin and the blessed twin. Yeah. So, anyways, we're not talking about any of that this morning. Uh, yeah, I'm, sure. I'm, I'm in church mode. Um, we are. We're talking about leadership. I and mean, look, leadership is kind of a. It's a buzzword in our culture. It's a buzzword in the church. And we can sometimes fall into this trap that when, when we talk about biblical leadership, it means that everybody is called to be a leader. And that's not actually the case. Um, you know, if, if everybody is a leader, that actually means there's no leader. Right. right? Uh, that's, that's, what it, that's what it means. And the other thing, too, is that we kind of have this mentality that, like, the I want to be the leader because I want to be the boss and be the one. And uh, the interesting thing is, The strongest leaders that I know, the people who I look at and I'm like, man, that guy has leadership coming out of his pores. They also tend to make the best followers because they know when to yield. They practice a different kind of leadership. That's true. You know what? I have said on many occasions uh, that the way a person follows when they are not the leader tells me everything I know as far as to whether or not they're even fit to be considered for leadership. Because, of course, for biblical leadership like we're talking about, um, you know, you're following a leader who must be following Christ. That's right. And so that whole idea of of yielding and and submitting, if you will, and and followership. And, you know, it's funny, like even even, uh, in my graduate studies, as I as I uh, took a leadership degree, uh, I really navigated to and focused on followership as a leadership attribute. And I think that that is the idea of, of submission and service is deeply embedded in the type of leader that I want to follow and the leader that I want to be. Right. And the, the thing we have to understand as we talk about leadership and all this, especially as we're talking about the theology around leadership, is that Christian leadership is entirely different from the world's leadership. And now it isn't that there aren't certain principles that easily cross over. And there are sometimes there are folks that, uh, you know, when they get into church leadership, say, okay, well, in business, we do this and that. And there are places where that can work. But for the most part, we're talking about a totally different model because the way that Jesus models servant leadership, which is what we talked about on Sunday, Mm is is something entirely different and part of what we have to understand too is that our familiarity with the scriptures can sometimes make this seem more commonplace to us so as we look at the first scripture that we're supposed to be uh unpacking today it's it's part of a parable and it's it's a it's a it's actually about watchfulness but there's this really interesting thing that happens in verse 37 of luke chapter 12 and it says it will be good for those servants who whose master finds them watching when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will dress himself to serve. will have them recline at the table and come and wait on them. Now, of course, the early part of that is a, is a command saying, be dressed, ready for service. Keep your lamps burning. You know what I mean? It's watchfulness. And it says that like for the, for, for the ones that are watching, who open the door when he comes, it will be good for those servants whose master finds them watching. But then there's this really interesting thing where it says, truly I tell you that the master who's come home will dress himself to serve. Like it's, and what that means is like he's going to be the one who like takes off the other clothing, like takes the towel, like 
Have them recline at the table. He's going to come and wait on them. It's backward. It should, if, if, the, if the parable was normal, the people are all expecting when they hear the story, they think they're going to hear the master will come and the master will recline. Right. And the servants will be ready to come and they will dress themselves for service. They've been dressed for service. They will wait on him. And that's the big flip. That's the big punch in the parable. And it's important for us to get that. Yeah, and this is where Jesus displays this servant leadership. And again, servant leadership kind of sounds like an oxymoron because like you say, like it's, well, the master is the one who should be served and, you know, they're his servants, right? It says when those servants, that's who they are. Right. And yet we see the master is the one doing the serving. And again, too, you know, it's funny, like it doesn't say servant leadership in scripture, Um that is a, a leadership style that, you know, the world kind of discovered uh, a little bit late. You know, a lot of the study on it was kind of more done with Robert Greenleaf in the 70s. And, you know, like it's discovered some new thing. Mm-hmm. Um, but of course, we see that that Jesus is the one who sets the example, you know, w- when he's on the scene on on what a true leader is. And, uh, you know, it's this, again, like you said, it's this upside down kingdom that we continually see uh, from Jesus where we have servants who are being served by the master. Right. And I think that's why we don't get it. And as I say, you can say these words like leadership or submission or even oxymoron. I know that you always thought that was just an idiot with acne, but that's, that's not true. what it is. I was an oxymoron for most of my junior high career. <laughs> that's, that's right. And, and so that's the case is just that sometimes we just have this this misunderstanding because it's so foreign to us because again, when we think of leader, if I'm going to be the leader in, in any, in any setting, whether I'm talking about like the, the leader of my family or I'm the leader of this organization or I'm the leader of this group or I'm the leader at work or whatever, we tend to have this idea of like, I'm the boss, like you go and do, you go fetch. And if somebody would say like, Oh, Hey leader, would you be able to do this thing? then we, we almost feel like, well, that's that's beneath me. Like right. That's beneath my pay grade. That's beneath my authority. There's there's going to be someone else to do the, 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 the trivial tasks. And we see that, that get completely turned on its head in this passage. We also see it get completely turned on its head in the life of Jesus. Yeah, that's right. And look, the there's a jarring moment in uh, John 13 in our next passage here, John 13, 14, where... Uh, Jesus has uh, gathered the disciples and he has washed their feet. And so it says, you know, after, after he has done this, which, you know, they're flabbergasted and there's protest and, you know, mm-hmm. we're, we'll get to the verse that we're talking about, but just so you know what's taken place. And in John 13, 14, it says, if I then your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, so also you also ought to wash one another's feet. And so here we see, again, this upside down kingdom where leadership is not like pounding out orders and directions and exerting authority or lording it over them, if you will. But rather, it's an example to be followed where the highest one becomes the lowest one. And again, it's just like the previous passage, right, where the servant comes and serves. You know, you see it played out. There's a a book. Now, I guess I can't throw it out and endorse it fully because I haven't read it, but I like the author. His name's Simon Sinek. Yes. And uh, he has this leadership book called Leaders Eat Last. Yes. And that's that's kind of the picture, right? And, and I think about that. You know, if you're in, in gatherings, uh, especially on an ongoing basis, you see that person that hovers around and navigates to the end of the line. Keep your eyes on that person mm-hmm. uh, because odds are that is someone who is a leader. The, the interesting thing with all this, too, is it's such a needed lesson in leadership. I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute because right. leading into this in John 13, the disciples were having an argument amongst themselves about something. You remember what that was about? Which one was the greatest? Who's the greatest? Who's the greatest? That's what flies in the face. Of it. And then the greatest among them, which, by the way, they're taking Jesus out of that equation. They mean who's the greatest amongst the 12, sure. obviously, right? Then the greatest among them washes the feet and then the application is direct it's immediate it's not confusing 
It's I, your master, have done this for you. Right. You should do this for one another. And the idea that sons are like, well, I'm not doing that for them. Like they can do it themselves yeah. or somebody else should be like, that's, that's not my job. Yeah. It is your job. And and that's how we love one another. And I would take it a step further. It's like this like kind of foot washing thing. If you can take it a step further where Jesus says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And it isn't if, because you have gushy feelings towards each other. Right. It's because you act in love that you serve one another and jesus sets the example and then and then like in case you missed the object lesson guys you do it for one another as well right. well again he's continually reiterating this and how they as the leaders of the church uh need to function need to operate and it's by example and again you know on sunday we talked about the the conversation of of james and john and how they want to be at the right and left hand of the lord in glory Mm -hmm. Right. And so, you know, you're presiding over quite a kingdom here if you believe that this Jesus is the Messiah, which they, of course, did. And so, you know, he's saying, hey, you want to be the greatest? You are a servant of all. You want to be a you want to be first. You are a slave like. It's it's again and again, Jesus, not just uh, telling them, but showing them, setting the example that this is how you are to operate. And again, you know, he, he can't make it any clearer than to, you know, get down on his knees and wash their gross, disgusting feet. Okay. These are not guys who are freshly manicured coming in from the hotel lobby. Okay. You're talking long, hot, all day walking with dirty, gross, sandaled feet. Right. Um, you know, like, I, I wouldn't want to go near a lot of people's feet at the best of times. And, right. you know, you got to picture exactly how low Jesus is going to make his point. When we're talking about servant leadership here, when we when we see the task that Jesus does to make the point, when he the son of God becoming man by by itself is a like a seismic stoop that we just make the leap all the time because it's Jesus. But right. that's that, there's no more lowering than that. But even when we get on the human plane, the idea that 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 foot washing is servant work, like it's well, I know we don't like this word, but it's it's connected to slaves. Like it's like I, I always think of uh, Jeff Snell teaching uh, through the book of Titus. And he was talking about that, like, you know, when, when Paul talks about being a slave to Jesus, and he said that word slave, it's doulos, the, the cleaner of toenails, right? Like it's the, the lowest. And if there's any picture to us that will get us off of our high horse, to get us off of our, you know, delegating tasks. And listen, there's nothing wrong with being the leader. Like, I hope nobody hears that. Then there's no, and listen, part of leadership is delegation and sometimes leadership is giving direction and sometimes it needs that stuff i'm not saying it doesn't involve that okay so let's be clear i'm not saying because we we made this distinction on sunday as well like servant leader does not equal doormat okay no. the same jesus that washes the disciples feet is the same one who calls the pharisees you know a brood of vipers the same one who upsets the tables like there's there's different times for that. We're like, this is not like a, just a picture of oh, Jesus was meek and a strong wind would blow him over. It's not a direction to run up to the leader in your life and treat them like a servant. Yes, yes. So let's let's hear that uh, for sure. But again, we need to make sure that we have this understanding that that Jesus is setting this example. And again, I think that that's the key word in all of the surrounding leadership is understanding because there's elements of it that are. They're just so foreign to the world's leadership. And they're also foreign to our culture, um, perhaps more so today than any other time. It kind of brings us to our next verse, which is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. And uh, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Submit to one, out of, to one another out of reverence for Christ. And again, this is a passage of Scripture it has that word submit in it. And generally speaking, we don't like that. No. Because we don't know what it means. 
Again, it's it's misunderstanding because then there's this idea of uh, the next verse is wives submit to your husbands. And then after that, we talk about children being obedient to their parents and, and talking about, uh, you know, masters and servants and, and this relationship between each other. And so this Greek word hupitasso keeps coming up. And again, we, we hear that with modern ears and we don't like it. Yeah. And but again, Jesus demonstrates it, right? Like yeah. and it's not to say that Jesus doesn't have, you know, a lot of do what I say, but he has all kinds of do what I do. It's not like he's saying, you know, submit to one another uh, as I Lord over you. And of course, he is the Lord over all. Um, right. but that's what makes it so upside down and so radical, right? That this Jesus, because even in terms of, of who he is, like that Jesus, King Jesus, if you will. For a, king, for a king to wash his subject's feet is already on planet doesn't exist. Like right. it's way, way, way outside of the scope. A king. I mean, you think of, you know, we're, we're in a, uh, a week here where we've just minted a brand new king, uh, the king of England, who therefore makes him the king of Canada, I guess, with the Commonwealth, whatever. Um can you but unpack all that for us really quick? You can't. You, you just, I just can't picture that guy down on his knees washing the people's feet because kings don't wash feet. Now, right. but the thing is, too, is like king is kind of like a a lower kind of earthly title for Jesus because Jesus is God. Yeah, yeah. Right? And there are, there are many kings. He is the king of kings. And so it's not just like, oh, well, this king came down to his subjects. It's like God, King, Lord, way up off the screen, it's so high, and yet he comes all the way down to the lowest of the low to right. soul and says, this too you should do for one another. And the, the, here's the interesting thing we have to understand because this is what's modeled for us, and this is hopefully what will help us understand this submission word, this hubitasso, is that Jesus comes down willingly. Right. Okay. So in Philippians chapter 2, it talks about how Jesus is God, who being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but was made nothing? No, but made himself nothing. Right. Taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, being found as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient or submitted right. to death, even death on a cross. It's a, it's a yielding. And that's what we have to understand when it says to submit to one another uh, out of reverence for Christ. It's not like the you know arm behind your back and, and you're tapping out, saying no more. This is a voluntary yielding for your good right. and for the greater good that we yield to one another out of reverence for Christ. That, you know, that says wives yield to their husbands in reverence for Christ, that children obey their parents like again it's it's for the good of the family unit it's good for the body of christ and then when it comes to you know masters and servants or what have you jesus says and, and again it all starts with that one in verse 21 that says you yield to one another and so look there have been people who have taken that out of context and either done it where they've made themselves doormats or worse they've used it to domineer which he's Jesus clearly says, not so with you. The Gentiles, you know, the world, they lord it over one another. That's not the way that we do it. And so I think that when people want to light their hair on fire because they see that word submit, again, I think a lot of what we're talking about today comes down to simple misunderstanding. Sure. And, and again, it you know, how many times are we told to be imitators of Christ? And that's exactly what's going on here. And just to, you know, not to belabor the point, but like you say, like imitating Jesus is not about being a doormat. It's not about being people pleasing. People pleasing is an insane way to live. It's too difficult. You'll go, you'll drive yourself crazy. You end up not pleasing anyone no. well, also, but that as we imitate Christ, we imitate his humility, right? Uh, we imitate his kindness, all those attributes, but there's also, you know, some pretty solid lines, some markers that Jesus holds us to that as we imitate him, you know, we follow those as well. You know, Jesus as leader wasn't his idea of instruction and submission wasn't, he didn't sit there like shrugging to the disciples saying, well, what do you want to do? 
Right. 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 And yet, as the leader, he's showing like, hey, like this is not me way up here pointing at all you little hirelings. But, you know, he was down uh, in the dirty work. And of course, you know, the most difficult uh, sacrifice of all. Right. It's, it's interesting that the picture of leadership that we get in the Bible is not kings, it's shepherds, mm. you know, and the shepherd lives with the flock. He loves the flock. His care is for them. His life is risked for them. Like everything is about them. Now, he, you know, he's the leader. He's the one moving it, but it's always for their good. And sometimes you get this bizarre picture where I think, again, we, we tend to think of the church in earthly terms where maybe we parallel with government and everybody should have equal voices and so on. It's not to say that, you know, a leader shouldn't listen to uh, to people in the church, but there's this absurd picture I've, I've heard of where, you know, say, imagine an uncertain shepherd mm-hmm. that's coming to a rocky territory and there's water over here and there's, there's darkness over there. And he turns to the sheep and just kind of shrugs and goes, I don't know, what do you guys think? Right? Like... Right. His, yeah, what, what do most of you want to do? Right. His love and concern is for them. And that's why he has to navigate them through the difficult places. And the sheep sometimes go, like, I don't see how this is helpful. I don't see how this is going to work. And it's wet over here and I'm cold and I'm hungry. And yet, again, his care is for them. And listen, if, if, if there's a leader and his care is not for the people, his care is not for the flock, and he should not be in leadership. No. And look, we, we understand this uh, because this is how – families function with parents. Right. Right. That when you're a parent, you are the, you know, the leader of your children and, and you do things for their good. You know, if you only had a little bit of food, you know, they would get it. You would go hungry or you'd come away with little, I think in most situations. And yet there are times when you, you know, you have to make decisions for the family that are unpopular, Mm -hmm. uh, the things that they don't understand. And look, don't hear me saying, that, you know, your church leadership is up here as parents and you're a bunch of goofballs that just don't understand what's going on. Right. I'm, I'm not making that parallel. Um, but, you know, there to that end, there are times, too, where even in church leadership, sometimes there are moves that are made just because there's information that they have and understand that is not for you to know. And, you know, they are ones who, you know, we talked about in, in Hebrews who must give an account. And yes. like you said before, leadership is the role of leadership is not for everyone. Right. And praise right. God for that. Um, and, and again, it's not always an, an easy road. In fact, often it isn't, it can be a lonely road. And uh, we certainly talked about those elements as well. So let's, let's just talk about that a little bit as we come into land. And I just want to, I just want to say this um, in a minute, you're going to pray. And I, what I'm going to ask you to do today is to, Pray for the leaders in our churches mm. and pray for the pastors. Um, you know, I heard a lot of stuff, had a lot of conversations this summer where coming out of COVID, I think a lot of people are looking forward to kind of sticking their head out of the gopher hole and the sun shining and it's good to step out. And you may or may not know what a hard and difficult season that was for your pastor how difficult that was for church leaders mm. you have to make decisions about. COVID protocols, opening and reopening or being closed. And there's a lot of startling statistics about how many people like left the ministry that they were in during COVID or just left ministry entirely. Yeah. That this, this, you know, this slogging and leadership got to the point where it was the other kind of submission where they, they tapped out and said, mercy, I can't do it anymore. Yeah. And, it's heartbreaking. And, and I've had some conversations with folks that, uh, man, I, uh, and again, people just, you know, they don't know. And part of it is because, as you just said, a lot of leadership stuff is lonely. A lot of stuff that you don't talk about and you can't talk about. And so I just want to uh, implore anyone listening today before we, before we close, pray for your preachers, pray for your pastors, pray for your church leaders, your elders and your deacons and, Sunday school teachers or youth pastors or children's ministers or whatever it is that you have, man, they, 
And, and I think especially of, of the elders, the, we mentioned this passage on Sunday, so you know they serve as ones who are going to have to give an account. The, the weight of leadership is heavy. And then yeah. there, I know there are some that you might think you want it until you get it in your hands and you realize this is not what I thought it was. Right. And becoming a, a obstruction to them is of no benefit to you. No value. And, and look, even just to that end, just very briefly, because I don't want to settle in here. Um, but God forbid you find yourself kind of sneering at, you know, the demise or the fall of, yes. of any pastors or, or elders or leadership. And look, sometimes guys get caught up in things and whatever. I'm not going down that road. Um, but it, again, if you kind of find yourself, you know, I hesitate to, to gleefully or even just with, again, kind of sneering down at, at that. I'll tell you what, you think about what it's like to sit in that seat and uh, it's not easy. That's right. All right. Anyway, let's uh, let's pray for those leaders. And uh, yeah, let's just do that together now. Our great God and Father, uh, I thank you for the ones that you have prepped to lead. And therefore, Lord, that you have prepped to serve. Mm-hmm. And uh, Father, I pray for those who find themselves in those roles, that you would give them steadfastness, that you would give them encouragement, that you would find people... Uh, faithful around them to protect them, to pray for their protection, to pray for their good, to bless them uh, as uh, men and women, Lord, who who have to give an account, who will be judged more harshly. Um, Father, it is not for everyone, but Lord, I do pray for those who have taken up that mantle of service, that you would give them the energy that that they need, that you would give them the rest that they need, that you would give them blessings that they need, encouragement that they need, and all of the wise things that we are too unwise to think of. Father, uh, indeed, give them wisdom. We thank you for them and ask for every good thing to be added to them. In the name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Ben. Appreciate your time and your your wisdom in this as always. And uh, this is this is good for you and I to have these talks as well. Yep, it, it sure is. All right, well, let's talk again next week. Same time, same place. You got it. All right, we'll talk then.